time has arrived. The beginning of a brand new Untold Legends timeline series on this channel. The beloved classic, the small robot boy that saved the world from his own kind multiple times over, the Blue Bomber Mega Man. This is a series that I've had in my head for years, and I'm finally getting around to creating it after so many requests over time. It's actually the number one most requested timeline series on this channel with Metal Gear being a very close second. But with so many versions of Mega Man, which one am I gonna be covering? I like these videos to be a celebration of everything that came from a series, so let's do it all. Starting with the original series that introduced the world to Mega Man. At this point in time, all of the different Mega Man series exist along one continuity, with the exception of alternate universes that aren't connected to the original timeline. Mega Man Classic leads to the X Universe, X leads to Zero, Zero leads to ZX, and it all ends with Legends. What's never been clear are those in-between moments, that interconnected tissue between the games that connect them together. There's never been official explanations from Capcom explaining those gaps with any detail. Only speculation and fan theories exist, and that's by design. Capcom has been very vocal that they have no plans to tell us. In a Q&A session involving reps from Capcom, they answered questions from fans. One of those questions, has what happened in the interim between the Rockman series, Japan's name for Mega Man by the way, and Rockman X series been decided? Or is there no canon version of what happened? Their response? Of course there is such an outline, but don't expect an official announcement of it. Players have always enjoyed using their imaginations to come up with their own conclusions, and we wouldn't want to take that away from them. In other in other words, use your imagination. So that's what I'll be doing with this series, covering the creation of these games, their in-game stories, and filling in the missing details in ways that make sense using a variety of sources like American comics, Japanese manga, written sources, animated projects, logical assumptions, but most importantly, the games themselves. And all those weird side games like Mega Man Soccer, the racing game Battle and Chase the MS-DOS Mega Man games, I'll do reviews on them so we can cover those as well. This entire series will be ongoing for a long time, but if you keep watching and supporting it, I'll keep on creating till we reach the end. Before we begin exploring the robotic world of Mega Man's future, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Into the AM. I've always hated wearing regular adult clothing, plaid button-up shirts that'll get you approximately zero I like your shirt comments out in public, your clothing should say something about you. Express your personality, that vibe that's inside all of us. I like my clothing to be bright. I like it colorful, creative, something a little more unique. Since 2012, Into the AM has been nailing that look and feel with premium apparel covered in unique designs. The shirts are buttery soft and shrink resistant. And one of the most important factors to me are how thin and breathable they are. They're not those really cheap, thick cotton shirts that are found in so many stores that make you itch like crazy when it's hot outside. What you're seeing here is just a small taste of the looks they offer. And right now, Into the AM has an excellent clearance sale going on until January 30th, anywhere from 30% to 95% off. But even after the sale ends, you can still find great deals and products. And you still get an additional 10% off if you use my discount code in the description. Not only do you get some cool merch and a discount by supporting Into the AM using the link below, you're also supporting this channel. So let me know in the comments which design is your favorite. And a massive thank you and shout out to all of my Patreon members for your support. You guys make these long form projects possible. And if you'd like to have your name up here alongside these heroes, get exclusive perks such as sneak peeks at upcoming content, detailed progress updates behind the scenes, access to the Discord exclusive channel, and early access to videos, go to patreon.com forward slash GamerThumbTV or click the link in the description to get started. With that, I would like to introduce you to the Mega Man Story Chapter 1, Rise of the Robots. And as always, if you'd like to jump right into the main story of the game, you can use the timestamps to jump to Chapter 1. When you get hold of the Nintendo Entertainment System... When you master Rob the Video Robot and meet the challenge of Gyromite. When you shoot the light sensing zapper. When you play the system with the most arcade hits. You're playing with power. The Nintendo Entertainment System. 
the year 1986. The Nintendo Entertainment System and the Famicom in Japan has taken the world by storm and is dominating the video game industry, quickly becoming a household name. The future was here. Children are playing video games with much better graphics than they were used to, higher quality sound, competent gameplay design, and they even had access to a real life robot buddy called Rob the Robot. But soon enough, Rob wouldn't be the only robot that kids associated with the Nintendo experience. It all starts with Japanese game developer Capcom. The Capcom of 1986 was very different from the Capcom that we know today. In modern times, they're a massive AAA game developer, with undisputed classics under their belt and a legacy of hit franchises, still releasing new entries on home consoles and PC. Capcom of the mid-1980s, however, was mainly known for developing arcade games and home console ports of those games. But they began making plans to strengthen their influence on the home console market with an original Japan-only Nintendo Famicom exclusive game. To create this new idea, Capcom gathered a very small team to put it together. Contrary to the enormous multi-person development teams of today, one of its most contributing members was a young man named Keiji Nafune, a newcomer in the company that had previously worked as graphic designer for the original Street Fighter. There is a common misconception that he was the creator of Mega Man, and although his contributions to the series are extremely important, the general idea for Mega Man and some of the character sprites were already created when he came on board. His mentor Akira Kitamura was the creator behind the general concept of the small robot whose hand could transform into a sort of gun and he could steal his enemy's powers. The character was designed to be small but strong, so some of his early names were Knuckle Kid or Mighty Kid, and due to his ability to change colors based on what weapon he was using, the name Rainbow Man was considered. Eventually, the production team settled on a music-inspired motif as the naming convention of the series. The hero of the story was named Rockman, and he had a little robot sister called Roll. Rock and Roll. Roll? <laughs> I was waiting for you, Mega Man. Ugh. And now I can battle alongside you against Dr. Wily. What do you think? No, Roll. I don't think so. Uh-huh. I can fight as well as you can, Mega Man. Roll, the stages from here on in aren't very easy. Once Inafune joined the development team, Rockman really began taking shape. He would travel to different stages with multiple enemies and platforming elements, fight a boss at the end and gain their power. And each boss had a weakness to a specific weapon from another boss, although each boss could still be destroyed by the standard arm cannon. The gameplay style was inspired by rock, paper, scissors. Simple and at the same time, fairly deep for the time. Inafune illustrated most of the game's characters. The box art, the instruction manual, the logo for the game. At the time, Capcom didn't have a team specialized in artwork, so he became responsible for turning simple drawings into a series of dots that would eventually become the sprites injected into the final game. Rockman's design was inspired by multiple sources after Inafune looked at characters such as Mario, Astro Boy from the popular Japanese manga, and Japanese superhero shows, specifically one called Ninja Captor. Rockman was intended to be white, but the Nintendo Entertainment System had a limited color palette of 56 colors. It seemed that blue had the most shades available, so the color was chosen to ensure that Rockman would stand out in greater detail when standing against the game's backgrounds. Rockman's creator, Dr. Light, Dr. Wright in Japan, was inspired by the jolly, kind appearance of Santa Claus. His nemesis, Dr. Wily, was the typical mad scientist character, inspired by the appearance of an evil Albert Einstein. Inafune illustrated the rest of the characters in the game, including the basic enemies and the eight robot masters, the bosses that Rockman would face at the end of each stage each themed after a different gimmick. Ultimately, the bosses would need to be trimmed down due to the limitations at the time. The ideas were narrowed down to a total of six. Since some of the basic sprites were already designed before Inafune joined the team, the first original boss he designed was Elecman, the electric-powered robot inspired by characters from American comic books. In fact, there's a very obvious resemblance between Elecman and Electro from Spider-Man. The robot masters that didn't make the final cut, Bondman, a glue-based robot that still hasn't seen an official appearance in a Mega Man game, although he does have a brief cameo in an unfinished state in one of the Mega Man Archie comic issues. Bubble Man was cut, a robot master that made his appearance in the inevitable sequel, and Oil Man, who we will get to later in this video. The story also went through some changes as development continued. In one early draft, Roll was going to be a much bigger part of the game. She was going to be captured Princess Peach style, and Rockman had to go rescue her. Another idea involved either a giant reprogrammed or a copy of Roll as a boss fight near the end of the game. In the end, Mega Man was just a simple story about a good robot defending humanity against an evil scientist, attempting to take over the world with bad robots. It didn't need to be any more than that. 
Mega Man. 21st Century Earth. The good Dr. Thomas Light creates Mega Man, a warrior hero with titanium battle armor. His mission? To stop the evil Dr. Wily in his quest for world domination, along with Wily's rebel robot force. During development, the decision was also made that Rockman would not be exclusive to Japan. Once it was decided that it would be localized for America, the name had to be changed. Rockman just wouldn't sound as good in the US. Especially with the common consumption of superheroes in American culture, Rockman would have been attributed to a guy with some kind of rock-based superpowers. Capcom USA's at the time, senior vice president, Joseph Morishi, had this to say about the name. That title was horrible, so I came up with Mega Man and they liked it enough to keep using it for the US games. Americans grew to attribute Rock or Mega Man as the character's given first name, and the name Mega Man as his suited up and ready to fight persona, just like a comic book superhero with a secret identity. After the name Mega Man was chosen, the differences outside of Japan would continue, and start to get weird. The story was totally different. Let me read some of the segments directly from the American Instruction Manual. This is not in the original Japanese version, by the way. It's Mega Man versus the powerful leaders and fighting forces of Monsteropolis. That strange, multifaceted land of robot-like humanoids. Dr. Wright and his assistant, Dr. Wily, encouraged with their very first near-human robot Mega Man, proceeded to develop six additional humanoids, all programmed to perform prescribed rituals. Assistant Dr. Wily turned disloyal, reprogramming Dr. Wright's humanoids, now bent on destroying opposition so Dr. Wily could control the world and its resources. Resisting reprogramming, Mega Man is chosen the defender of the universe and its inhabitants. Mega Man dares to single-handedly, this is really hard to read, Mega Man dares to single-handedly penetrate separate empires of Monsteropolis, eliminating the leaders and followers of the sovereignties. I know that was a mouthful, but the robots are described as humanoids, Dr. Wily is Light's assistant, he tries and fails to reprogram Mega Man, the world of Mega Man is a giant layered city called Monsteropolis, it's divided into seven empires and each one is ruled by one of these humanoids, it's weird and it's all made up. None of this is part of the actual in-game story and it was never referenced again in future titles. And it gets even weirder. The NES Box Art Nintendo Entertainment System box art is an art form. Games lived or died by their box art. The kids of the 1980s didn't have internet, no YouTube gameplay videos. They mainly had video game magazines and word of mouth. Often games were grabbed off the store shelves because of their artwork, and many times it looked exponentially better than the actual game could ever look. I still remember buying a cheap copy of Wizards and Warriors Iron Sword because it had Fabio on the cover, this muscular barbarian man and I remember thinking, cool, this is going to be like a Conan-like game. And when you boot it up, your character is just a typical knight. Nothing like the box art. This was common back in the day. The Japanese version of the Mega Man box art looked fine, cartoony, it represented the game well. The European version had a more realistic look, kind of creepy in many ways, but it looked awesome. But then in the US, I mean, just look at that. Just look at it. I don't even know how to describe what's being displayed here. Mega Man's completely miscolored. He's got these enormous shoulder pads, a classic Tron helmet, a handgun. He's posed like he's holding in a number two from falling out. I guess that's Monsteropolis in the background with giant random palm trees out of Vice City. Orange things on the ground, some kind of shells or floating lights of some sort. I, nobody knows what's going on in this image. There's a reason for all of this though, and it's not completely the artist's fault. It's Capcom's. Their sales department didn't think the game was going to sell very well. The president of Capcom USA gave a marketing rep the job of getting the front cover done by the following day. The representative had a friend draw it in about six hours, resulting in this image that has become infamous as one of the greatest examples of horrible video game box art. So infamous that Capcom has actually embraced this mysterious middle-aged man as bad box art Mega Man. Even referenced in games like Resident Evil 3 Remake, it's shocking. Even more surprisingly, he was playable in Street Fighter Cross Tekken, with a full character story and ending. One of the most entertaining things I've ever seen. This is how you embrace a failure. One day, Mega Man learned about the meteorite that landed in the Antarctic from his good friend and companion, Roll. Roll guesses that the box that was contained inside the meteorite could be from an ancient civilization. 
Are you serious, Roll? That thing came from outer space! There's no way it could be! Some sort of an ancient man-made satellite! Not wanting to debate, Mega Man travels to the South Pole in search of the satellite. Even if it's empty, the box itself could be useful! Good luck, Mega Man! All right. In December of 1987, Mega Man released in both America and Japan, with a European release two years later. In the US, critics gave Mega Man mostly positive reviews, describing it as an excellent blend of action and challenge. Some even recognized what would be considered in the future, it was an instant classic, an opinion that time has proven to be correct. However, Capcom wasn't impressed with the sales numbers. Mega Man sold more than expected, but it was never considered a commercial success for them. The game mainly sold from word of mouth from kids, and Inafune has even gone as far as blaming the bad box art as the reason the game didn't sell as well as it could have. And he could be right. Regardless, it left a lasting legacy among games, starting a long line of multiple sequels and it built a reputation of being one of the harder games on the NES. The gaming industry accepted Mega Man as a gaming icon, with gaming magazines and fans giving us the nickname The Blue Bomber, a nickname that Capcom embraced. There's much debate on where the name The Blue Bomber actually originated, but it's widely assumed it's a reference to the Blue Robot from the classic children's game Rock'em Sock'em Robots, who also happens to be called The Blue Bomber. You're slugging it out in the middle of the ring! And you a hard right to the job! And Blue Bomber's block is knocked off! His block is knocked off? Sure, but you can press it right back on again. It's just part of the action with the world's only boxing robots, the Rock'em Sock'em Robots by Marx. And as was common of the era, anything remotely popular guaranteed an animated series for American children. This pitch right here looked fantastic, and it had a very similar look to what we'd know as classic Mega Man today. In the final version that actually broadcast on American TV, Mega Man was aged up appearing more like a teenager in a series of debatable quality that resulted in unintentional hilarity. All right, Magnet Dude, give me five. He's getting my powers! Now I've got your power! Oh no! He's gonna blast President Lincoln! Ha! <laughs> I knew you'd risk yourself for Mr. Lincoln! And who could forget the small, lovable, chubby, chain smoker Mega Man from Captain N, the Game Master. And last but not least, Mega Man is my gift to my favorite little robot. I made her just for you. I don't want a friend like me. You should thank Dr. Wright for his thoughtful birthday present. No, and it's not my birthday. Over time, the original Mega Man received multiple ports, and a from-the-ground-up remake, Mega Man Powered Up. It was exclusive to the PSP, released in March of 2006. This time around, the story was fleshed out a bit more with cutscene moments and voice acting, with fully 3D widescreen graphics in the game's new style mode and altered stage layouts. It also included an old style mode that's closer to the NES version with better graphics. And the characters were stylized with a chibi style with big heads. With the PSP 16-9 widescreen aspect ratio, the bigger head size allowed the development team to create more visible facial expressions. The more cartoon-like appearance of the game was meant to give the designs a toy-like appearance geared towards children, and Powered Up had several quality of life improvements over the original game, including multiple characters like Roll and Proto Man. If a Robot Master was defeated with the standard base weapon, they'd be fixed by Dr. Light and become playable characters. A level editor allowed players to upload their levels to PlayStation Online, and some of the original ideas from the first game returned. The Robot Master cut from the game, Oil Man, was redesigned and included, with altered colors in the US due to his design uh, that could be considered a bit problematic for obvious reasons, and an original Robot Master called Time Man was created exclusively for Powered Up, increasing the boss number to the standard 8. With all these additions and improvements, the game performed well with the critics, but sales numbers were considered horrible in Japan, while selling a bit better in the US. 
The unimpressive numbers doom the classic series remakes to end with just one game under their belt. In retrospect, the low sales were possibly due to the game coming out so early in the PSP's lifespan, in an era where Nintendo undoubtedly ruled the handheld market with a DS. But that's the story of the original Mega Man's creation and legacy, but why did Dr. Light create robots, only to turn one of them into the ultimate weapon of justice? And what caused Dr. Wily to enact his selfish world-dominating plans? The distant future, the era known as 20XX, an era in which humanity was entering a new age. Technology was rapidly evolving, and humans were finding themselves more and more dependent on technology. Two young men studying at the Robot Institute of Technology sought to push the future of robotics further than anyone could imagine. The classmates became close friends and colleagues, but that friendship would be tested when the school formed a committee to see whose research would be funded further. Light and Wiley's vision of the role of robots differed greatly. Thomas Light's research focused on a combination of robotics and advanced AI. He envisioned a world where robots would eventually live and work with humans, coexist and build a better future for everyone together. Robots that could think for themselves and make decisions. Albert Wiley, on the other hand, saw robots as nothing more than end goals, machines that gave humanity a reason to celebrate their scientific achievements. His experiments and ideas were usually somewhat unethical, and he was prone to bouts of bitterness and rage. Thomas Light attempted to stop his experiments multiple times. In school, Wiley developed a tool he named the Double Gear System. Once installed, it could push a robot beyond its limits and arm it with unstoppable power and insurmountable speed. Light argued that the Double Gear System was dangerous and it could be misused. Its raw power could also cause damage to the internal systems of machines, but Wiley argued that the same power could be used to turn a robot into a hero or a weapon. I strongly believe Albert's research must stop. <sighs> Light! We can't build the future on your empty optimism! Say what you will, I cannot agree to this! Please listen! No, you listen to this! At every turn you've ignorantly blocked my research! Mr. Wily, control yourself. I see the committee is in agreement. And so, the department chooses Thomas Light's research into robots with independent thought. Thank you, everyone. Why? Why are you fools so blind? Once the committee concluded, Light's research into robots with independent thought was chosen. Wiley stormed off, furious that his research was pushed aside and Light confiscated his now broken double gear system for safekeeping. Eventually both men graduated with PhDs in electronic engineering, but Wiley always found himself in the shadow of Light's success. Due to his experiments, he earned himself a ban from working on advanced robotics. After his education finished, Thomas Light continued building his career and continued his research in the field of robotics from his new laboratory in the city of Monstropolis. His inventions changed the world and made it a much safer, more efficient society that resulted in improving air and ground traffic control systems, construction projects, and more, resulting in the now Dr. Thomas Light receiving the Nobel Prize in Physics and the World Engineer Award. Wiley was overcome with jealousy and he vanished for years. Several decades passed and in time, Dr. Light and Dr. Wiley reunited to check in on each other from time to time and share ideas. Although Wiley had previously been banned from working on advanced robotics, his knowledge still held value. Dr. Light's robots became normal parts of society as Wiley continued his own research in secret. By then, Dr. Light was a much older and wiser scientist. And after decades of failures and testing, he finally devised technical plans to build a robot that could live side by side with humans. A robot that could think for itself. Dr. Light was a pacifist, believing that violence was a last resort to solve problems. He was forced to accept contracts from the military to fund his experiments, in exchange for promising the military advanced fighting machines. He had plans for a line of weaponized robots as part of his Robot Master series. For now, the prototype he designed would stay by his side, and he invited Dr. Wily over to his lab to celebrate the activation of his first humanoid robot. 
model number DLN, standing for Dr. Light number, 000. Dr. Light designed DLN 000 in the form of a young human boy, and Dr. Wiley was impressed how much he appeared to resemble an actual human. While he booted him up for the very first time, his visual receptors began detecting light, and his robotic mind began forming thoughts. The first person he saw was Dr. Light with his kind smile, welcoming him into the world. Dr. Light had taken his humanoid robot project so seriously that he was already attached to his creation and referred to the machine as his son. The first step was to run diagnostic and ensure that all his internal systems and motor functions were operating properly, all reporting to be normal. Dr. Light was immediately amazed that the robot was successfully self-aware and questioned his surroundings, but Dr. Wiley wasn't impressed. He was too busy taking measurements for future weapon upgrades. Dr. Light was more interested in seeing how the prototype would interact with the world. He took him outside and the robot began developing curiosity and a personality of his own. He chose a scarf from a store that drew his attention, interacted peacefully with other living creatures, and Dr. Light took him to art museums to learn about human culture. One aspect of human culture immediately intrigued DLN 000, music. Dr. Light often played music in his lab while he worked, and the robot became curious of what that sound was that he kept hearing. The music playing was called blues and the robot adopted it as his name. He was no longer just a model number. He was the creation and son of Dr. Light, Blues. The time had come for Dr. Light to deliver his promise to the military and met with them for a weapons demonstration. He armed Blues with a prototype energy cannon designed by Dr. Wiley, the Proto Buster, and warned him to be careful. It was a simple demonstration of what a robot soldier could be capable of. When the test started, Blues demonstrated his independent thought processes by taking cover to avoid live fire. This test would show the value of robots in future military operations in order to reduce risk to human life. Blues performed beyond expectations, dodging attacks quickly and responding with firepower of his own. But Dr. Light began noticing strange behavior in his movements. Something was wrong. Blue systems were malfunctioning and he suffered damage to multiple areas from an incoming attack. Immediately, Light stopped the test and ran to Blue's side to make sure he was okay. He ran diagnostics and discovered a flaw in his system. There was an imbalance in his power generator, his very core, and the strain from the exercise pushed him beyond his capabilities. The military was only concerned about why the machine failed, but they were impressed enough to continue funding Dr. Light's research. Dr. Light's only concern was Blue's well-being. He took him back to the lab and studied the problem closer. While consulting with Dr. Wiley, and the two men began arguing, Wiley argued that Light was too attached to this machine, and he should be the one to perform alterations on his power core to fix the problem. Much to their shock, Blues was connecting to a charging station and filling up his power core again. He woke up much sooner than expected and walked in on the conversation. And he immediately became concerned when he heard about his redesigns. Dr. Light explained Blue's situation. The power generator in his chest was flawed from a design level, and it was only a matter of time before it would fail. In order to save Blues, the core had to be redesigned and reinstalled. But there was a risk that his personality would be erased during the procedure. If the operation worked at all, Blues could be a blank slate again or cease to function. Searching for advice, Dr. Light reached out to colleagues from the Robot Institute of Technology to discuss the risk to Blues. Blues apprehension to being repaired was a result of Dr. Light programming him to have a free will of his own. The robot was experiencing a very human emotion of fear. And out of frustration, Dr. Light made a comment that he didn't mean, implying that he should rewrite his personality to erase his rebellious nature. For Blues, that was the last straw. He wouldn't risk losing who he was, even if it meant his days were numbered. He packed up portable energy containers and fled, giving up the only father and home that he ever knew. Once Dr. Light discovered that Blues was gone, he was heartbroken. Dr. Wiley visited him and discovered that his lab was a mess, and he sarcastically suggested that Light should build housekeeping robots in order to keep everything organized. He found the doctor sulking in his misery. Blues was gone and he wasn't coming back. Dr. Wiley was distracted with the staggering amount of money the military gave Dr. Light and barely acknowledged Blues' disappearance. But Wiley did attempt to calm down Dr. Light with logic. Blues was simply a means to an end, the first step in a greater creation, and he convinced him to begin his Robot Master project, free-thinking robots designed to serve humanity. Wiley wanted to rush out weapons for a paycheck, and Dr. Light wanted to give robots time to live, learn, and grow. Although they differed in opinions, both men agreed to work together on the Robot Master line. Blues decided to travel through the human world. It was vast and unfamiliar to him, but in many ways it was like Dr. Light's lab. Robots had been used regularly for various purposes throughout society, but no other robots were like Blues. 
These were programmed to perform basic simple tasks, not designed for friendly interaction or intelligent conversation. One storefront owner even confused Blues with an actual human child after recommending a haircut. Blues decided that he was better off on his own, away from the humans. He had nobody to relate to in the human world. But something in him awakened when he heard a family calling for help. They were surrounded by a biker gang about to assault them for entering their territory. They huddled together in fear, and Blues jumped into action. Dr. Light would have been amazed. Blues felt it was the right thing to do, and made a choice to help. It wasn't a behavior that Dr. Light ever programmed within him. The biker gang attacked him thinking he was a child, an easy target. And although Blues was small in stature and light for a robot, he was incredibly heavy to a normal human. They tried pulling him with their chain, but one of the bikers went flying as Blues didn't budge an inch, and he effortlessly blasted their bikes with his protobuster. The couple was grateful for this mysterious hero, and Blues disappeared into the shadows. He felt his power core overworking itself again, and almost experienced the same power failure from his military exercise. He had to be careful and conserve his energy. But Blues couldn't resist being a hero. When people needed help, he answered the call at the cost of his own well-being. He decided that saving lives was an important enough function, and the thought of any fathers and mothers losing their children was something he couldn't bear. Eventually, he ran out of the portable energy tanks he took from Dr. Light's lab, and could only replenish his energy by resting. Blues began realizing that with every recharge, his maximum energy output was becoming smaller and smaller. His power core was becoming critical, and his thoughts returned to his life with Dr. Light. He missed his father and decided to finally return home after so long. All he wanted was forgiveness for running away, and perhaps Dr. Light had figured out a way to fix him. Blues began his long journey home, but he wasn't ready for the painful discovery he made once he arrived. While working on his robot master project, Dr. Light decided to take on another project, remembering Dr. Wiley's comment involving housekeeping robots. The lab had been a mess since Blues left, and Dr. Light was totally absorbed in his work. In his younger years, he missed the chance at having a family of his own, being completely focused on advancing the field of robotics. And nobody to share his life and accomplishments with did get lonely at times. But Dr. Light had the knowledge to build a family of his own, and decided to create a pair of housekeeping robots, one son and one daughter to live with. He gained a vast amount of knowledge from building Blues and began constructing his robot successor with an improved power generator that could handle much more output. And Dr. Light also began building a robot in the form of a young girl so they'd keep each other company and act as a younger sibling. Dr. Wiley saw the project as a waste of time. His comment about housekeeping robots was never meant to be serious. His focus was for Dr. Light to finish the Robot Masters, but Dr. Light was excited to activate his two children for the first time, model numbers DLN-001 and DLN-002. In honor of Blue's chosen name inspired by music, he named the pair Rock and the Girl Roll. When Rock awakened, he was greeted by the same friendly face that Blues saw, welcoming him to the world. Just like Blues, Rock and Roll were self-aware, and Dr. Light refrained from programming a specific personality for them. They were a blank slate that would develop their own. Their only program functions were to keep the lab and house in order. With those tasks, Rock and Roll went above and beyond, ensuring that everything was clean and orderly, breakfast was always made, and he treated them with love and kindness as if they were his own children. The family was happy and felt complete, but when Blues returned home from his long journey, he caught a glimpse of the warmth that was denied to him. He felt an incredible anger and pain. Dr. Light called him his son and then was replaced as if he were nothing. From then on, Blues accepted his fate and traveled far away from the city he once called home. He took comfort in the fact that all the choices he made up to this point were his own. He would choose to die on his own terms. Back in the city, Dr. Light was nervously preparing for a presentation. His robot master line was mostly complete, and he was officially going to reveal his robots to the world. Robots that would work alongside humans in various tasks. Sometimes dangerous ones where human lives would no longer need to be risked. Crowds excitedly gathered to see Dr. Light's new creation in Titanium Park. While Dr. Wiley showed up to see the Robot Masters, Dr. Wiley provided input on their creation, but ultimately it was Dr. Light's genius that completed their designs and built them. Immediately, Rock and Roll approached Dr. Wiley and asked if he needed anything. Rock attempted to shine his shoes, and Wiley was instantly annoyed and disturbed that Dr. Light's robot was inside his personal bubble. 
Dr. Light always seemed to have these robots around, and Wily demanded that he present the Robot Masters alongside Dr. Light. Since he assisted in their creation, Dr. Light demanded credit, but having Wily on stage would undermine everything they were trying to accomplish. He'd already been banned because of unethical experiments, and the pair had been over this conversation several times and it always came to a standstill. But Wily had a plan, and this was the final straw. Wily congratulated Dr. Light and reporters began gathering as the Robot Masters were revealed. The six of the total nine that he had time to complete before the presentation. The three missing robots were still in the development stage and unfinished. Bond Man, Time Man, and Oil Man. Light explained how these six would benefit humanity, but reporters were ready with uncomfortable questions of their own, specifically about Light's history with the military. But Dr. Light had left that work behind. The military was a means to an end to fund his research, but he was done building weapons these robots would serve humans, not fight their wars. While Dr. Light was speaking, Rock noticed something was off with Dr. Wily. He walked off angrily mid-speech and enacted his plan, his revenge against Dr. Light and the world that denied his genius. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. The name's Wily, the one and only, the brilliant scientist, Dr. Wily. It may seem rather sudden to you, but I've decided I'd like to take over the world! <laughs> anyway, to begin, Dr. Lee, I'll be taking your precious robots! <laughs> that is to say, what's this? They'll work robot. They're just a pile of scrap metal with no special abilities. <laughs> Dr. Wily was gone. He interrupted the news broadcast with his own announcement and stole the Robot Masters right in front of them. He'd considered taking rock and roll, but determined that housekeeping robots would be useless to his plans. A mistake that would cost him for the rest of his days. Dr. Wily had been planning his betrayal for years. Since he helped design the Robot Masters, he secretly placed exploits within them that would allow him to completely overwrite their commands. The world would pay for pushing his ideas away since his youth, and Dr. Light's name would be tarnished. While building them, Dr. Wily secretly inserted his own control chips that reprogrammed their main functions. Once he activated the Robot Masters, their new orders were to cause maximum chaos. Instead of serving humans, they attacked the city and destroyed anything and anyone in their way. Dr. Light, Rock, and Roll returned home to Light Labs to figure out what was happening, and Rock rushed to turn on the morning news. The robots had risen and the attack began on the city. Police and military were called in to handle the situation, but Dr. Light's robot masters were designed to set a new standard in robotics. They couldn't be stopped by conventional weaponry. Dr. Wily took over the broadcast and took credit for the attack, then demanded complete and utter surrender from world leaders. Dr. Light's own connections in the military reached out to him asking for help, but there was no way to shut down or destroy the Robot Masters. Dr. Light sat down shaken. His life's work was stolen from him and used for nefarious purposes. His own ambitions may have just brought doom to humankind. He broke down in tears while Roll attempted to comfort him. Rock couldn't stand to see his father in anguish and felt a deep rage, watching his robot brothers harming humans. After a thoughtful silence, Rock uttered one determined phrase, I'll do it. Dr. Light was caught off guard. Dr. Light built the Robot Masters with similar material as Rock, so he figured that he could do something to challenge them. He demanded that Dr. Light turn him into a battle robot. Roll and Dr. Light feared that Rock could be hurt, but there was no choice. The risk had to be taken and there was no time to waste. At the same time, Dr. Light was amazed by Rock's bravery, another aspect he hadn't programmed within him. Rock chose to be a hero, just like Blues had before him. Dr. Light immediately got to work and used his knowledge working with the military and everything he learned from Blues to turn Rock into the ultimate weapon. Rock's power core was a solar reactor that in theory could convert energy into powerful blasts. Dr. Light further enhanced his reactor to allow for more energy output and used ceramic titanium known as serotanium to build his body armor. It was lightweight, sturdy, and more durable than standard titanium. The designs for Blue's protobuster were used to create a more powerful arm cannon that would draw energy directly from Rock's power cells, providing less strain on his reactor core. The upgraded arm cannon was named the Mega Buster, and Rock's helmet protected his head, made from the same material as his armor. But stronger firepower alone wouldn't be enough. 
Dr. Light theorized that the Robot Master's weaknesses could be exploited by using their own abilities against them, and he inserted a copy chip inside Rock. The chip would allow Rock to absorb the abilities of other robots and incorporate them into his own weapon systems. With that, Rock's battle armor was complete, and Dr. Light looked upon him proudly. He built the boy and gave him the name Rock based on his love of music, but Rock had grown past his roots as a household servant. It was time for Rock to choose his own name. The world would know this new hero as... Mega Man. One of Dr. Light's many experiments was a teleportation unit. He used the opportunity to test it out and sent Mega Man downtown, where the military was struggling to fight back. Another light robot ready to destroy them. When they saw Mega Man, the soldiers were terrified. But Mega Man calmed their fears with a warm greeting. He was there to help fight back. Dr. Wily watched from his mysterious location and recognized Rock. He was horrified when he realized that Dr. Light converted him into a battle robot. If anyone could ruin his plans, it'd be the meddling of Dr. Light. While Mega Man helped the military, Dr. Light worked on tracking down the locations of the Robot Masters. The first one he located was model number DLN-006, Bomb Man. He was attacking an excavation site to the east of the city. Once Mega Man arrived, he realized that Dr. Wily's plan went far deeper than a couple of Robot Masters revolting. He had also programmed the Robot Masters to emit a signal that rode over the commands of all the simple robots in the area. Dr. Wily had an army. Finding Bomb Man would be no simple task. Mega Man was attacked by all of Dr. Light's creation. Screw bombers originally designed to be fire extinguishers, now armed with damaging projectiles. Beak blasters, wall-mounted gun turrets meant for military applications. And Sniper Joes, robots based on the design of blues. And one of Dr. Light's first successful mass-produced military robots. As Mega Man made his way to Bomb Man's signal, he was bombarded with killer bombs. Once used in the excavation site to destroy objects, security robots known as Spines traveled back and forth across the floor, attempting to stop intruders. Every machine was going haywire. Flying shells were used as drones equipped with cameras, now armed with weapon systems and a protective shell. And the excavation site was filled with hazards, construction tools and pits with spike-like protrusions. One fall and Mega Man's armor would be compromised. Although the Robot Masters weren't designed with the same level of free will as Mega Man, they still developed their own personalities. Bomb Man had a very teenage-like and cocky attitude, and he became mesmerized by anything explosive, especially fireworks, and oddly enough, he developed an interest in bowling. Bomb Man was intended to work in demolition and land development projects at the excavation site, and he barricaded himself inside his lair with octopus batteries. Simple barricades meant to block off restricted areas, but it was time for Mega Man to test his abilities in a real battle, and defuse Bomb Man's rebellion. Bombs! Uh-uh! Don't run off! Let's have a little fun with my explosives! Bomb Man, that's really dangerous! Stop setting off bombs! You should have come the day before yesterday! I had some big boom booms then! Don't cry now! Mega Man unloaded his Mega Buster on Bomb Man, making short work of him. Dr. Light's upgrades were a success, and Mega Man activated his copy chip for the first time. When he touched Bomb Man, the weapon schematics for the Hyper Bomb were downloaded into his Mega Buster. Now Mega Man had the ability to create powerful explosives in the form of a bomb. During the battle, Mega Man held back and felt incredible guilt seeing Bomb Man deactivated on the floor. In an act of mercy, he teleported Bomb Man back to Dr. Light, and luckily, he was able to repair him and undo Dr. Wily's programming. Well done, Mega Man! Thanks to your mercy and kindness, I can repair these robots! Thank goodness! Right, Mega? You battled and defeated my robots without destroying them and brought them home. It's all thanks to your efforts. You're a great help. The next target was located at a nearby quarry, DLN-004, Gutsman. When Mega Man arrived, he found the same behavior in the robots that the ones in the excavation site were displaying. They were all hostile. Even simple supervisor robots called METs meant to watch workers. And the worker robots were also revolting. Several upgraded METs with bodies called Picketmen. Gutsman wasn't meant to work alone in the quarry. 
Dr. Light originally designed him to accomplish his tasks in coordination with Bomb Man for land reclamation and construction projects. Guts Man would lift heavy objects like rocks that were too heavy for standard machinery, and Bomb Man would use explosives to clear tunnels. Like Bomb Man, Guts Man had his own personality. He was hot-tempered and impatient, but he always made sure his co-workers were safe in the field. And like Bomb Man's bowling quirk, Guts Man enjoyed karaoke. Mega Man made his way deep into the quarry following Guts Man's signal, and he was attacked by more robots. Bladers, equipped with fast-spinning blades that were normally harmless. Meant as camera drones, the blades were now flying into the targets on purpose. But one of the most dangerous threats was the Big Eye Robots. More surveillance machines that were top-heavy, meant to crush large objects. If Mega Man wasn't careful, he would be crushed next. When he survived the Big Eye and confronted Guts Man, he activated and tested his new Hyper Bomb. Guts! Hey, men only! Little boys don't belong here. Go home before you get hurt. Time to punch out and go home, Guts Man. You big idiot! What'll happen to me if I get fired? I'm gonna take you down with me. Ready! <laughs> Copy chip worked flawlessly. Gutsman couldn't withstand the explosive power of the hyperbomb. He was damaged, but not destroyed. So Mega Man copied Gutsman's super arm, which gave Mega Man the ability to pick up heavy objects and throw them with force. He teleported Gutsman back to Dr. Light, and he was able to repair him as well. If Mega Man kept up his current progress, he could save all of his robot master brothers. The next target, DLN-003, Cutman, who was hiding in an abandoned sawmill as his base of operations. Cutman was designed by Dr. Light to assist in wood-based projects. He would help cut down trees with his sharp cutter blades by launching indestructible scissors from the top of his head. He developed one of the more stubborn personalities of the Robot Masters, often not listening to others, and at the same time he was extremely gullible. Dr. Wily reprogrammed him to attack humanity, but with barely any effort, told him Mega Man was a bad robot. And Cutman assumed that he was the hero of the story. Before he was reprogrammed by Dr. Wily, he had developed a passion for cutting hair. From within the sawmill, Cutman launched his blades outside the window in an attempt to destroy Mega Man, but it failed. And flea robots meant to drive pests away from crops jumped all over him, and they had no chance of penetrating through his armor. When Mega Man arrived, Cutman condemned his evil ways. Brother? Believe it! Dr. Wily was right! You've changed into a bad robot! Cutman! What's going on? You're an evil fighting robot now! I'm gonna stop you and make you good again! Cutting it up! Cutman was one of Mega Man's easiest battles so far. Amusingly, he was reminded of the human game Rock, Paper, Scissors, a game that Cutman was particularly bad at. And again, Rock beat Scissors. Cutman was buried under a pile of rocks and couldn't move. So Mega Man used his control chip to absorb Cutman's rolling cutter, an airborne set of his boomerang scissors made of serotanium. Then he transported Cutman back to Dr. Light for repairs and reprogramming. There was a large energy spike in the region coming from the local nuclear power plant that DLN-008, the Lechman, was supposed to be managing. He was a robot master intended to control the voltage in the facility and in short remain stable. He was in communication with Dr. Wily, now aware that Mega Man was coming. Wily had sent Elecman a shipment of additional robots to place his traps for Mega Man. Instead, Elecman took it upon himself to come up with a plan of his own. He took control of every power conduit inside the facility and turned it into an electrified death trap. After his creation, Dr. Light considered Elecman his greatest robot master, an answer to the energy problems in some parts of the world. But Elecman's personality also made him difficult to deal with. He was fiercely intelligent but egotistical and full of himself. He had an unreasonable dislike of anything made out of rubber and took up playing electric guitar when he wasn't working. True to his words, Electman had made the entire facility extremely dangerous for Mega Man. Electric energy burst from the walls and watcher robots, like many of the others originally meant for surveillance, were turned into weapons and attacked Mega Man while he was trying to climb through the facility's levels. Electman waited in the control room at the top and Mega Man was prepared to cut his wires. Well done! But you say goodbye here. I might even tell you more about me after I win. I don't have any reason to fight you, Elect Man. Come on, let's go home. You'll never blast through my heart with that kind of attitude. 
It's really too bad. But I'm going to finish you at lightning speed. <laughs> Dr. Wily was enraged watching from his surveillance room. If Electman had just followed his orders, instead of showing off his powers, he might have been able to defeat Mega Man. Mega Man's rolling cutter knocked Electman out and held him in place long enough for Mega Man to absorb his Thunder Beam. High voltage electrical firepower that could go through multiple enemies at the same time. And Electman was also saved after being repaired by Dr. Light. Only two robot masters remained in Wily's arsenal. His plans for world domination were being quickly unraveled by a robot created for housekeeping. DLN-005 Iceman took over the water treatment facility and froze the entire area inside and out. Dr. Wily promised him that he could keep it all and build his icy empire among the humans. Iceman was a robot master built to make the field of exploration safe for humans. He was capable of exploring regions below sub-zero temperatures and working them efficiently. Iceman enjoyed showing off his ice based abilities and participating in any snow related fun, especially snowball fights, and he disliked the thought of warm places like saunas. Although he could operate in warm conditions, he was at his most powerful when surrounded by cold. The slippery cliffs and caves outside of the water treatment facility were protected by crazy razy guard robots that could separate their bodies into two functional pieces. Pengs, flying robots modeled after penguins, and intended to be used for wildlife photography, and Mega Man used robotic footholder platforms used to move heavy equipment to cross the enormous gaps. The frozen paths were challenging, but Mega Man was ready to give Iceman a shocking defeat. Reporting for duty! There's something dangerous up ahead, sir. Oh, freeze it at all costs, soldier! I don't believe it! Iceman! Even a loyal robot like you! Well, sir, I... Soldier, finish your mission! Stop and freeze! For Mega Man, the battle was effortless. The electric shock immediately disabled Iceman. Mega Man's control chip absorbed Iceman's Ice Slasher, a sharp ice blade that could freeze Mega Man's foes with temperatures below 200 degrees. And Iceman was repaired and returned to his normal functions after returning to Dr. Light. The final robot master remaining was DLN-007, Fireman. He was working on compromising the core of Steel Foundry when Mega Man discovered his location. The furnaces in the foundry were overloaded, and flames were spewing through the whole area. But the flames weren't anywhere near hot enough to melt Mega Man's serotanium armor. Fireman had spawned several tackle fires throughout the building, small robots covered in his flames that allowed him to monitor Mega Man's progress. They were his eyes and ears. Fireman was intended to work as a portable incinerator for waste management facilities. His flames could reach beyond 7,000 degrees, able to melt through almost anything. And he was one of Dr. Light's most dangerous creations since it involved working with high temperatures and having Bomb Man nearby was a risk. If Bomb Man were accidentally ignited, it would have destroyed Light Labs. But Dr. Light had Iceman on duty in case there was a fire. Fireman was obsessed with justice and saw himself as a charismatic hero. When he wasn't being used for his work purposes, he enjoyed camping outdoors, although rainy days kept him from enjoying them to the fullest. And Mega Man was more than ready to put out his flames. power of the Ice Slasher, Fireman was frozen solid, and a single punch from Mega Man shut him down. Flame Man's power gifted Mega Man with the Firestorm, a hot blast that gave Mega Man the same ability to melt or ignite almost anything. The Robot Masters were all defeated and repaired, but the world wasn't yet safe. Dr. Wily was still out there, and Mega Man had to stop him once and for all. But Dr. Light still hadn't discovered his location. Roll rushed to hug her brother, who was safe and sound. However, Mega Man would only be home for a short time. When Dr. Wily was found, he would need to leave quickly. In the meantime, Dr. Light ran diagnostics on Mega Man, fixed any small dings he received during his battles, and made sure that his weapons were all charged up. He also installed a new tool that he developed while Mega Man was gone, an addition to his Mega Buster called the Magnet Beam that could create platforms for him to travel on. Hi, hi! Dr. Light, your robot 
Those are nothing but junk! <laughs> How horrible! You! Dr. Wily, you are a most foul man! <laughs> Feeling sorry for yourself, Dr. Light? You're full of regret, aren't you? Well then, come to my fortress, Castle Wily! I've already sent you an invitation! Don't disappoint me! Dr. Wily's invitation reached Mega Man and Dr. Light with his location. He was hiding at Wily Castle, a giant robot manufacturing plant that he had built himself over the years. Dr. Light was perplexed how Wily could have the funds to accomplish such a task. Unknown to Dr. Light, Wily had been stealing from Dr. Light's funding sources. Light was so involved in his work that he failed to notice any petty theft. Wily had amassed a fortune over the years, materials and a workforce of robots building other robots with his genius designs in place. Wily Castle was located on an island in the Pacific Ocean, and when Mega Man arrived, Wily waited patiently with glee. He had a trap ready for his new nemesis. Mega Man entered right through the front gates and ran through the first couple of floors, fending off a barrage of Dr. Light's reprogrammed robots. Dr. Wily made the entire structure almost impossible to traverse on foot, with spike traps everywhere. But Mega Man used the robots as stepping platforms and his new magnet beam to arrive to the top safely, where Dr. Wily's first original combat robot was waiting. devil spoke in its own language that Mega Man didn't understand. The core of the robot acted as a levitating black sphere that resembled an eyeball, and it was protected by a thick body made from shape memory alloy. The alloy took a gelatinous form and it could dismantle itself into multiple pieces. The only vulnerable spot was the protected core. <laughs> Fortunately, the Yellow Devil wasn't like Dr. Light's robot masters. There would be no way to disable it, take it back to the lab, and have it reprogrammed. It was a war machine from its very conception and had to be destroyed. Mega Man was getting closer to Dr. Wily. Soon there'd be no place for the evil scientist to hide. Dr. Wily was monitoring his progress and activated one of his most secret projects. Mega Man may have been armed with a copy chip that could duplicate special abilities, but Wily had built a machine that could copy entire robots quickly. A sort of instant robotic 3D printer. Hey Blue Bomber, just a little unfair to steal other robots' arms, don't you think? A clone of me? How far will Dr. Wily go? But I guess being a copy of you would make me the biggest cheat of them all, right? <laughs> Dr. Wily used it to create a copy of his most dangerous enemy, Mega Man. If the Robot Masters failed to destroy him, an evil copy of himself could surely do it. The battle was a struggle. The copy Mega Man was armed with all of the same abilities and matched his movements almost perfectly. But ultimately, there was no substitute for the real thing. Beyond Copy Mega Man, there were several suspicious looking tunnels leading down through Wily Castle. It led through a treacherous pathway filled with hostile robots and water. Dr. Wily flooded those passages to test how Mega Man would be affected in deep water, but it seemed that Dr. Light had thought of everything. Light's battle robot was indeed waterproof, it was just as efficient in combat as he was outside the water. One of Dr. Light's creation for the city was patrolling the area. Intruders bad, eliminate intruders! Intruders bad, eliminate intruders. Please, let me pass. Negative, must eliminate. 
The CWU-01P was created for water purification. Once Dr. Wiley got his hands on it, he reprogrammed it to become a hostile weapon. Mega Man was successful in destroying every attacker that came his way, but everything was going according to plan. Dr. Wily intended for Mega Man to get this far where his trap laid in wait. If he happened to be destroyed before that moment, it would have been a simple bonus. What Mega Man found was shocking. It was an automated robot factory with multiple reproductions of Gutsman. They were unfinished still, but Dr. Wily must have been building this facility for longer than anyone suspected. At the end of a walkway, Mega Man found a lone teleporter similar to the one in Dr. Light's lab. He believed that it must have led directly to Dr. Wily's location. But this was Mega Man's first major conflict, and he was still very naive about Wily's obvious traps. He entered the teleporter and found himself surrounded by familiar faces. It was impossible. The Robot Masters were all reprogrammed and waiting at Light Labs for reactivation. These were a result of Wily Castle's robot production factory. Since Dr. Wily worked on the Robot Masters, he had an intricate knowledge of how they operated. He built copies of all six and activated them with the sole purpose of destroying Mega Man. But Mega Man had already defeated them in single combat, and he was familiar with all of their weaknesses. <laughs> These copies weren't programmed to have any kind of personality, they were empty husks devoid of robotic life, only following simple coded attack commands. There was no need for Mega Man to hold back in an attempt to spare them. Although they were copies of the originals, Mega Man still felt guilt for destroying them. He believed that all life had value, even robots. Perhaps if they'd been saved, they could have had a chance to be something more. But there was no going back, Wily had to be stopped and he was furious that the Robot Master project had failed him again. He had no choice but to take matters into his own hands. If only I programmed you differently, Doc Dan, it would have been genius! It's the only mistake I've made in my life! I'm really angry, Dr. Wily. Using innocent robots for your evil plans? I won't forgive you for this! Why, you insolent fool! I will crush you with a loud, loud crunch! Behold, my latest creation, the ultimate combat robot, Wily Machine Number One! <laughs> Wily was promptly defeated. He regretted not taking Mega Man with the Robot Masters when he had the chance. In desperation, he quickly built his Wily machine, resulting in a concoction of machinery that stood no chance against the abilities that Mega Man had absorbed. Dr. Wily conceded defeat and decided that he would die with the satisfaction of knowing that he was a better man than Dr. Light, since Dr. Light had to turn to brute force to defeat him. But Mega Man had no desire to hurt Wily. He extended his hand and offered to help him leave. Reluctantly and having no other choice, Dr. Wily left with Mega Man and they returned to the entrance. Then Mega Man contacted Dr. Light and reported that Wily had been captured. Dr. Light and Roll were overcome with a feeling of relief. The nightmare was over and Mega Man was coming home. Dr. Wily was taken into custody by the police, but he was a cunning man filled with backup plan after backup plans. He had accounted for multiple scenarios in which he'd be captured. He reported to one of his spy robots what time he'd be moved from the county jail into federal custody. Dr. Light and Mega Man volunteered to join the police during the prison transport, and Mega Man questioned what prison would do for Dr. Wily. He was confused by the thought that humans couldn't simply be reprogrammed to be good people like a robot could. These concepts of what it meant to be human were things that Mega Man was still struggling to learn about, and when they arrived, Mega Man equipped his helmet and weapons in case of any emergencies. Back at Light Labs, two robots were casing the area beginning steps of Wily's contingency plan had been activated. That afternoon, while the police transport was on the highway, a Sniper Joe appeared and opened fire. It destroyed some vehicles and caused a wreck, and Mega Man immediately jumped into action. Something was very wrong. He couldn't move. 
and the mysterious robot appeared. It broke into Dr. Wiley's vehicle holding cell and took the mad scientist with him, and as suddenly as he appeared, he disappeared. Mega Man disabled the sniper Joan destroyed it with a blast from his Mega Buster. Suddenly, the police detectives on duty realized that Dr. Wiley was gone. Nobody knew what happened. In their minds, they blinked, and he vanished. It was as if time was missing. The other robot was waiting at Light Labs when Roll arrived home from grocery shopping. She noticed the doorknob was covered in oil and turned around to see the culprit. The robot demanded that Roll come with him and threatened to take her in pieces if she didn't comply. Mega Man knew that Wily was gone and Roll was home alone. He teleported back home to make sure she was safe and found a ransom note dressed Dr. Light. Roll was kidnapped and her life was in danger. Dr. Wily warned that he would contact them with more information when he was ready. Mega Man was devastated that his sister was in danger, but he had to do something. The two robots delivered Dr. Wily to an abandoned factory he had ready as a backup base, and they released Roll into his custody. They were difficult robots to control, constantly at each other's throat like fighting siblings, much to Dr. Wily's annoyance. The two robots had developed personalities that were complete opposites of each other, but they were meant to perform a specific duty, and as long as they were successful, Dr. Wily could care less if they got along. Roll had never seen them before and didn't recall Dr. Light ever mentioning these. She curiously asked Dr. Wily where they came from. The two unknown robot masters were some of the unfinished designs that Dr. Light came up with. DLN-00A, Time Man, and DLN-00B, Oil Man. They were much more powered up compared to the original Robot Masters, and equipped with an advanced AI system that made them even more intelligent. Dr. Light felt they weren't quite ready to build yet due to their experimental natures. Dr. Wily decided to study the plans and build them himself as personal Robot Masters. Eventually, Dr. Wily contacted Dr. Light with his current location, another clear trap. In response, Mega Man arrived with his now reprogrammed brothers, the original six Robot Masters, and the police. The full force of the law and Dr. Light's robots were coming down on Dr. Wily, but he wasn't found inside. Instead, Time Man appeared. He had the ability to slow down time to a crawl and used it on the Robot Masters. Time Man and Oil Man's goals were to lure and destroy Mega Man using Roll as bait, and they wanted him alone. They escaped the factory and Mega Man followed their locations while the police waited for him to return. Time Man teleported to a nearby clock tower, whose inner workings were filled with reprogrammed light robots as before. Time Man waited patiently for Mega Man to appear, he was getting impatient. He was punctual to an extreme, and calculated every hour, every minute, every second of every day. Time Man's obsession over time resulted in a bossy attitude, demanding that others not waste any time, and he often chose to thinking versus talking, since thinking could be computed faster. Had he been completed by Dr. Light, Time Man would have been used in time travel experiments. But Dr. Light still had a very basic understanding of time. His theories on time travel were just early ideas. When Mega Man found him, Time Man was thankful that he arrived before the calculated time. Time's up! You're early for your appointment. Huh? What appointment, Time Man? Oh joy! By being early, you've given us an extra point three seconds. <laughs> Mega Man absorbed his time slow ability that allowed him a limited power to slow down time for a few seconds. Since the robot was essentially a Dr. Light creation, Mega Man spared him in case he could be reprogrammed by Dr. Light. Oil Man was hiding out in an oil field, and he was spraying synthetic oil all over the place. His function would have been maintenance duties in these oil fields, such as cleanup, stocking, and production. The inside of his body helped the molecules needed to produce oil, and in theory, he would have an endless supply that was constantly regenerating. Opposite to Time Man's seriousness and punctuality, Oil Man was carefree and reckless, and enjoyed making skateboards out of his own oil. Time Man considered him to be loud and obnoxious, but his attitude wouldn't save him from the Mega Buster. Yeah! Hey, what'd you come out here for? Don't you got a place near your house for Phillips? Oil man, let's go home. You for real? Even if that just slipped out, we are still gonna do this. Yeah! It's showtime!
Mega Man Absorbed's oil slider, and the last two complete Robot Masters were taken back to the factory, where the other Robot Masters held them in custody. They might have been defeated, but Roll was nowhere to be found. Time Man and Oil Man didn't have her. Suddenly, Dr. Wily reappeared and released her. Mega Man was ecstatic to see his sister safe. Dr. Wily had no desire to harm her. More importantly, the entire scenario was a distraction to keep Mega Man and the authorities busy. It was a wild goose chase. The Dr. Wily that stood before them was revealed to be an advanced hologram. Dr. Wily had never been there. When Time Man broke him out of custody, he took Dr. Wily to an alternate location, where he was preparing his Wily UFO escape craft complete with stealth systems and a new location ready to receive him. Dr. Wily's plans for world domination were just beginning. Mega Man and the authorities had failed to catch him. Join me next time for the Mega Man Story Chapter 2, Dr. Wily Strikes Back. Wily relishes in his escape and uses the lessons learned from his first world domination attempt to build a new, more dangerous fortress, and creates his own line of original robot masters dedicated to destruction. And while Mega Man attempts to bring Dr. Wily and his line of robots to justice, Wily debuts the first in a series of Mega Man killers, a battle that will take Mega Man into the far reaches of space.